marvellous. Good, still got strength. Excellent. Hello, everyone. Rejoicing in the Lord. Excellent. I just wanted to start off today um, revisiting something which uh, was shared with us. Uh, Mohammed sent us a, a, a word, as he does from time to time, Mohammed Niku. And, um, and uh, I just want to read a little bit of it. The whole earth, says the Lord, is in a new season. I don't mean one of the four seasons of the year, but a heavenly season. A season in which things are changed in the earth and will not go back to the way things have been. We're now in a whole different season and the moving forward of time to the fulfilling of the divine purposes. But what does exactly does that mean? We're in a time of a new season. One thing that's safe to say, when there's a new season, all the former things that have survived the season mutate to a different understanding. We have a different way of doing things. So if you were to continue to do things in the way you've been doing things, you'll find there's no grace. You'll find there's no grace from God in which to do these things. For the majority of people in the earth, that doesn't mean much, because in the majority of cases involving churches and ministries, from one season to the next, they keep doing exactly the same thing they've, done, they've always done, and they call it God. Even in nature, when the seasons change, animals will migrate because failure to migrate may well mean the difference between survival and not survival. Every time God gets ready to deposit another increment of the same thing, there will need to be a sound, there is a sound from heaven, and what it's waiting for is for the echo back to God from a people who see it, get it, and once it's happened, It changes the whole order of the earth. So this is a time of a new season. It's a time of year when we send cards, some of us, with season's greetings inside. But this is a season that needs to be greeted, needs to be received. This is a season that has never happened before. And it's all part of what we've been talking about for this period of time. A new season needs, requires us to change. It requires us to change in our position, in our expectation, in how we see things. And so my question for us today is, am I ready? Well, actually, that's my qu- I don't want you all to answer, am I ready? <laughs> Obviously, because uh, I've got to answer that one. But you know, this is a new season And I cannot stay doing the same things as I was doing before in the same way as I was doing them before and expect to receive the grace that I was getting then. That doesn't mean the things I was doing weren't good. In fact, many of them were God. But actually what God is calling us to is a different position, a new season. We live from a different source. It starts from God, his power to save his word to us, and his grace to live by. It starts with God. It starts with God. And whatever new thing God is doing in the earth, it starts with him and no one else. It doesn't come out of our dreams, although God may influence those. It doesn't come out of our cleverly clever thoughts, although God influences those too. It comes and originates from him. It's, it flows out of him. And I believe there's a significant change that God is calling us to. I was looking, when we, were, we had a time of prayer for Sierra Leone, and Angela reminded me of this story from 2 Kings 7. And um, it's one of the darkest chapters uh, of, of the story of Israel. It's a really difficult time. And it's a time of an end of a famine. I'm not going to read the whole story, uh, you can look at it later, but don't have nightmares about it. It is a really awful time. Um, there was a great famine in the city, uh, and it had lasted for so long um, that a donkey's head 
which doesn't sound like the choicest piece of meat, sold for 80 shekels of silver. Now, I'm, I'm not great on currency, but 80 shekels of silver is a lot. Okay? And a quarter of a cab of seed pods sold for five shekels. Seed pods don't sound like the bit of the plant you're supposed to eat. I'm not a biologist, but I understand that the energy and everything comes from the seed, not the pod. So you normally get hold of the seeds and you chuck away the pods. But things were so bad, that's what the people were, were having to, to, to eat. And there's a horrendous story, which I'm not going to go into detail of, 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 uh, of basically a kind of cannibalism going on amongst the people as well where they're so short of things. And so the king of Israel sends for Elisha and says, um, he says about Elisha, may God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if the head of Elisha, son of Shaphat, remains on his shoulders today. So if you were the man of God, it, it wouldn't really be a very great place to be. But actually God spoke to Elisha at that time about a time of a change in the season. So... The messenger came to him, and, and the king said, uh, said, this disaster, this disaster is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Elisha replied, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. About this time tomorrow, a seer of the finest flour will be sold for a shekel, and two seers of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. The officer on whose arm the king was leaning said to the man of God, Look, even if the, if the Lord should open the floodgates of heaven, could this happen? You'll see it with your own eyes, says Elisha, but you'll need not eat any of it. This was a time of an, aw- it was an awful period uh, for the people of God. They had, had fallen right away. They had nothing. Uh, and God is delivering through Elisha a clear word of change. This is what's going to happen. You are currently lo- longing for the taste of a donkey's head. But by this time tomorrow, you're going to have the food that you expect, the food that you, and the currency is going to be worth what it used to be. When a clear word comes, we can hear it or we can scoff at it. The officer whose arm the king was leaning on scoffed at the word of God. Even if God could open the floodgates of heaven, could this happen? Well, it seems to me that he's missing a point somehow. Later, basically some lepers go off uh, and uh, they're, they're at the gate and they're really hungry, so they go off into Samaria, and uh, they come to the city, and they find that the Samarians have got so frightened of the people of God that they've all run away and left everything. They find a deserted city, they find plenty of food, and the lepers are the ones who go in and say, wow, this is great, and they go back to the king and tell him about it, and when, of course, the people hear about the plenty that there is, everyone piles in. But the man who's the servant, who the king was leaning on, he gets trampled in the gate. He gets as far as Samaria, can't believe what he's seeing, and he gets trampled in the gate and dies. For us, it's really important how we hear what God is saying to us. I don't want any of us to get trampled in the gate of God's provision. We have to be really serious about God's word to us. Simply hearing is not enough. God's word needs to be taken hold of, and and we need to we need to take hold of that truth. We need to watch out for the scoffing spirit, and I don't mean the way you eat your cakes. Okay, I mean if someone comes up with a bright idea, you know sometimes we, we have you know the saying. What do we have? One of our little, little sayings that we have. It's a 10-foot hat pin. Now, that's not a 10-foot hat pin, but there's a nice bright idea, and he's about to burst the bubble. You know, the, the guy in that story was trying to burst the bubble, really, of what God was saying. And, um, and actually, he suffered for it. 
I don't think that any of us are going to die. Not literally. But I think there's a danger that we carry on doing the same old, same old without the new grace. And we don't have the life in what we do. So God's ordered us to come to a new place in him. God knows the times and the seasons. And he, he reveals his plans through us, to us through the prophets. God, in fact, had taken care of things in this story in a way that no one expected. So that when, we op- when they opened the door, when they went into the city that they expected to be full of the enemy, they found it to be deserted and they found a whole source of provision they never knew existed. And, um, yeah, so failure to heed the word resulted in the, in the death of the servant. That's a really heavy story, so I'm going to illustrate it now with something that's a little bit more light-hearted. I've had a bit of a busy time lately, and, um, and uh, you ever have that thing, battle with your car fuel gauge as to whether it's the time to go to the fuel <laughs> petrol station or not? Um, so you drive, and you see the needles going down, and you think, I, I, I can probably, I don't need, it's not convenient now, I'll not go now. Um, so uh, Wednesday night, I'm driving home uh, in my lovely, my, my lovely little Corsa. Thing is, it's a diesel, so I forget about going to the, because it goes on forever. Well, not maybe forever, and it's not an advert for Vauxhall cars. <laughs> it's probably not like a, Vo- a Volkswagen, but uh, it does seem to go on for a very long time. And I was driving home, and I'd already seen that the needle was getting a little bit close. It wasn't at the bottom. It wasn't at the bottom, but it was getting a little bit close. Then the warning light came on, saying I was running a bit low on fuel. Now, a diesel car's not a car you want to run out of fuel in. Um, And um, I knew I had to fill up soon. I was two miles from home when the light came on, so I thought, well, that's fine. I'll just leave it. So I parked at home, had my tea, and then I had to go out and get the fuel. So I get in the car, turn the engine... (coughs) <coughs> no, wasn't going to go anywhere. Unfortunately, that in my car does not mean there's any fuel left. And I didn't look like that at all. But, <laughs> but I thought it was an appropriate picture. You know, we can drive around in these things that take us places with very, very little fuel and expect it's all going to be okay. Many of us, our journeys are very short in London. If we lived out in the sticks somewhere, then we'd be driving much longer distances. But for many of us, our mileages are not great. And so you constantly are driving, thinking, well, I'll I'll get to it, I'll get to it. Um, I thought, that's a funny thing. How is it I've managed to run out of fuel? Well, I've been too busy. I mean, these all sound very stupid, don't they? Been too busy. And um, the, temp- the fuel gauge, well, I, I know I've got plenty of fuel left. Um, I'm a little, bit, a little bit funny with my car. I like to zero the trip every time I fill up, so I know how far I've gone. You know, you can do that. So I'd done 396 miles, and I was convinced that I could do 400 miles before I needed to fill up. <laughs> um, I hadn't really recognised how far I'd come. There were other things that were more important. And, uh, you know, I could just get it done at another time. I was making it the very, very next thing I was going to do. But I didn't quite get there. You see, if I'm running on empty, the car's fine until you want to use it for the intended purpose. If you just want to admire it, have it parked outside the front, which probably is unlikely in my case. But if you want to have, you know, go out and stroke it from time to time or, or check that the tyres look nice and things like that, that's all fine. But if you actually want to use it for the intended purpose, it's not much use without fuel. The energy comes from the fuel, not the tank. You can have a marvellous fuel tank. Um, But if it's a diesel and it's decided you can't use the bottom little bit of the tank because when it runs out of fuel, it really does a lot of damage. I kind of know that with one part of my brain. Um, You know, it's not going to get there. 
the fuel gets used up. No matter how much you might think it doesn't get used up, it really does. And the higher the mileage, the more fuel is used. Now, Jesus couldn't have told a story about my courser, but he did tell a story about some lamps, which also ran on oil. In Matthew 25, oh, sorry, when you need it, it won't go. See, in Matthew 25, we can read the story of the wise and foolish virgins, it's what we might call it, or the wise and foolish brides. I'm just going to read you this story. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who had their lamps uh, and took them and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. The foolish one took their lamps but didn't take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in their lamps, in oil in jars, along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they became drowsy and they fell asleep. At midnight, the cry ran out, uh, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And all the virgins woke up. And the foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, because our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There's only enough, there may not be enough for both you and us. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on the way to buy oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins were ready who already went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. You know, these guys, they were ready to do something. This story is a story about the kingdom of heaven. We were learning last week that this is a story of the kingdom of God. It's really about, it's about being ready for when we're called to action. Many people see this as about being when Jesus returns. But I actually think this is a little bit, for me, this is a bit of a picture of my car on the forecourt. That night, I had an intention to go and visit someone. Instead of which, I had to spend an hour, well, more than an hour, actually, by the time I'd faffed about, going and finding where I got the oil, the petrol can, wherever it was hidden, somewhere at the back of the shed in the dark. Gone to the petrol station, bought the fuel, come back, couldn't get it to go in, poured out all over the floor, making a mess, getting fuel over me, over the car, all the time praising the Lord and thanking him for his goodness to me. And then got into the house about an hour and a half later and thought, I haven't really got time to do that thing I was going to do now. If we're not prepared, if we're not ready, well then when the Lord comes, when we hear his voice, when he calls us, we can miss out on what he has for us. Now, there can be lots of reasons for being unready. Um, it doesn't really take very long to think of these. I don't know why. I've read them in a book somewhere. You can be caught up in doing stuff. You can fail to see the signs of the fact that you're running a bit low. You can get used to living in a certain way making up with a certain lack. Sometimes we can even fall asleep. Sometimes we can fail to see how much we've done, how far we've come. And actually, maybe we don't realise how long this journey is that God's got for us. So God wants us to actually be in a place of readiness. You know the excuses... I'll get to it in a minute. What I'm talking about here, the oil in the jars, is not real oil. Okay, It's a picture of how we need to be in connection with God the Holy Spirit. And how we need to be re- open to him, receiving from him daily. You know, I'll just get this done. I'll talk to God about it when I've finished because it won't take much longer. Well, last time I had this situation, I don't really remember what God said. I think I'll just, I'll just see it through. I'll do it myself. Sometimes it's not about how far we've come. It's actually stuff has happened on the way that knocks us around. And we can settle for less than what God has for us. So, 
bearing in mind, obviously, this is purely theoretical and not something that could ever happen to anyone, I thought it might help you to see a photograph of someone, I think, who might be running on empty. What does it look like when we are running on empty? Do you know, I think we, there, is, there is something happening amongst some of us, because I've actually had a few conversations with people, about a dissatisfaction with where they're up. And I believe there's a dissatisfaction sometimes with how we are. I was recently in a conversation with someone. Um, it was actually a text conversation. But, but we were exchanging thoughts on what we expected of this new season. And this is something that I wrote. How I am has to change. It's not about what I do or don't do, but a revelation of God, his love, acceptance and forgiveness of me. His utter delight in knowing me as his son, that this gives me strength to rule rather than being carried along by the pressures of life, to take a kingly position in all I do. I believe that for some of us, there's, a, there's an aching, there's a longing for something more. Something more than you currently have. Sometimes, um, and this is not to, that's a serious point, not to lighten the load, you can describe some of You know there are phrases that teachers like to use. This, this, chap's, uh, this chap's efforts this term have been more perspiration than inspiration. Um, but we, our approach to life can be like that. A lot of effort. Actually, the word inspire is, is actually to, is to do with being breathed in. And God inspires us, breathes his breath into us. We don't need to perspire. We can know his provision. Things that ought to be a joy can become a drudge. We can be knocked about by circumstance. Um, a sort of subheading for all of this is that it's about my soul getting a bit noisy. I've got a spirit which is absolutely given over to God and, and, and it's wonderful and it's fantastic. But I have a soul who sometimes cries out and makes a noise. And, and that soul sometimes complains when I'm tired. Sometimes complains when uh, uh, maybe I don't want to do something. And that soul cries out. Maybe it's what, where my natural pity might come from when I'm looking at a situation, when I need to have God's compassion. This thing called a soul sometimes gets noisy. And I believe that when God moves us from one season to another, our souls get noisy so that we... Because, because we're basically fighting a battle to move us to that next position in him. There is one who prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for people to desire, to, to devour. And um, we need to be real that actually we need to take captive those soulish thoughts so that we can move on to the thing that he has for us. We can get impacted by things all out of proportion. Uh, I've worked in my place of work. Well, I've got paid by them, and some of the time I've done some work. Uh, I've worked there for quite a long time. Uh, in fact, this is my 23rd year in the same job. Someone said to me, are you good at interviews? I said, I wouldn't remember, really. I've done one or two interviews since, but... After 23 years, I had had a complaint when I was about, oh, about 22 about not being able to teach electronics, never having studied electronics and only being asked by the school to teach electronics uh, in 1993. Um, it was a kind of funny little time, but I learned that and that was fine. Just in this last term, 
I had a little gaggle of, um, of upper sixth who decided that they didn't like the way I was teaching them. I think I was expecting them to think too much. <laughs> so, so they went along to the deputy head and they went and told him that they didn't think much of my teaching and told, me that I, and I told him what I was getting wrong and, and all these things. And, um, and there were various things that happened after it that could have been handled differently. <laughs> Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, humility, self-control. Anyway, um, lots, of things, <laughs> lots of things that could have been handled differently. It actually didn't change me, didn't need to change me. I wasn't any different afterwards, don't know what I was before, um, and God's showing me that I don't need to be knocked about by circumstance, by things that happen around me. I don't need, I don't need to be knocked around. God's designed us to be a safe place in a storm, not to stay in the harbour, but to be a play, safe place in the storm. And I think Another sign of running on empty is um, we can be resentful. We can grow resentful of others who live life in a different way and seem to have it easy. What a wonderful place we have in relationship with the living God. What a wonderful place that he's saved us, that he's reached out to us, that he's brought us into connection with him. And when I look at my colleague who needs to know the love of God, and I, and I like his big house, and think, that's not fair. He's got a big house, and I haven't. What's going on in my heart is I'm completely missing the provision that God has made for me and my family. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What a promise. What a promise that God has showered upon me. What a, what a blessing <coughs> my family are to me. What a fa- blessing this church is to me. Different ones of you in different ways, you know. I'm not going to go into that. Um, but, you know, what, a, what an amazing place we have. And God is bringing us to a place of appreciating him. Despite the noise of our souls. So, my question is, how ready are you? Are you there? Or are you there? Unlike my car, you don't actually need to go to a special place to get filled. There is no shortage of supply and he doesn't accept MasterCard. And you don't get any points. But the free gifts are amazing. It's a different source. As I was preparing for today, I just came back to that to that picture that we had when we, when we shared that stuff on the source. And I just don't want us to miss the profound significance of the fact it starts with God. It starts with God. Everything that he's ever done on the earth, he starts. But what, he, what we begin in the spirit... We need to finish in the Spirit. It's quite possible to start with Him and go our own way. It's a different source. He restores us with Himself, but He also restores us with others. And where you've got broken relationships because of resentment or unforgiveness, God's power is real to bring resolve as you repent of those attitudes. And this amazing upside-down world means that as I submit to him, so I rule. He rules through me. It brings a release 
of kingdom rule. Instead of being knocked here and there, if I submit to him, he brings kingdom rule. When I was, um, I was just uh, in Manchester uh, with Owen, we were one of his volleyball <coughs> things. I went past this, uh, it, the, the place he was playing was opposite some church in Manchester. And it said outside, it was like advertising Alpha, it said, would you like to start again? And I thought, well, what a funny thing to have outside. I wonder how many people do want to start again. But that's exactly what Jesus told Nicodemus. When, when, you know, when he's co- talking with, with Nicodemus, he says, you know, if you want to see the kingdom of God, you've got to be born again. There isn't a shortcut. We can tell people about Jesus. We can show Jesus. But there is no shortcut to starting again in him. And you know when you start again in him, you never get a better place than that position of grace. It's a new birth, a whole new creation. It starts with him. A new life is made. So if my fuel gauge is at the wrong end, what can I do about it? Well, we've done part of it maybe today, some of us. Jesus says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Someone once said that we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. We don't give in order to get. That would be like the slot machine. That would be like going to one of those things in those ghastly arcades where you put, I've heard, you know, your, your, your t- notes in the top and the change comes out at the bottom. A totally predictable exchange. But what we do know is that the measure we use, it's measured to us. God's measure is a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. If you've ever seen someone measuring out rice by volume, it makes a massive difference how you stack the cup to the weight that you get. And God's, God's measure to us is not grudging, but pressed together, running over. Another thing we can do, in fact, perhaps even before we give, is ask. Ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. That's Matthew 7, 7. So don't worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. I always tell Christina that when she's worried about what I'm going to wear to things. (laughs) Doesn't always work, but there you go. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. I was, I was just talking with someone the other day, and, and I was just, it just came to me afresh how important that is. There is no other place, there is no other one who, who's at the top of our priorities. Seek first the kingdom of God. So when we're worried about God's provision or, or what's going to come, seek first his kingdom and all these other things will be added to you as well. So what I want to do is, um, is I just want to give us an opportunity, really, to just think about how noisy, how noisy is your soul? 
Is it complaining about the new place that God has for you to move to? Because it's time for our souls to get in line with what our spirits long for. Our spirits are longing for something more, I believe. There is, a, there is a dissatisfaction. How I am has to change. Not what I'm doing, necessarily, although after 23 years you might think that might change. The colour scheme might change of my slides, Daniel, as well. How I am has to change. God's placed his provision for us ahead in this new season. And uh, we, we, need to, we need to be alert to that and, uh, and looking for that. And listening, listening for the cry of the, maybe the leper who's found the provision of God, who's found a new place, someone you wouldn't normally have listened to. It's time for us to get hold of our soul and to tell it to be quiet. Psalm 62, 5 says, Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. Be still and wait calmly. Be still, O my soul. The Lord is on your side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to your God to order and provide. In every change, he will remain. Be still, my soul. Your law will undertake to guide the future as in ages past. Your hope, your mind, your will, let nothing shake. All now mysterious shall be bright. Be still, my soul. The hour is hastening on. When we shall be forever with the Lord, with disappointment, grief and fear are gone, sorrows forgot, love, joys returned, restored. Be still, my soul, be still, my soul, and praise him, and praise him. This is not, it's not, about, um, this is not about just passively waiting for, for the return of the bridegroom. This is about our readiness to catch his eye at the table. When we wait on God, we're not, we're not waiting we're not waiting as we wait for the 86 and we don't know when the 86 is going to come and then the analogy really breaks down because we certainly don't get three of them at once. But, but when we wait on God, we're expectant. We're expectant and waiting for his word. 